you might call him the accidental photographer. Henry Dils is an iconic, primarily music photographer, who has recorded images for more than 250 album covers. He was the official photographer at the Woodstock Music Festival in 1969 and the Monterey Pop Festival in 1967. Dils's iconic images of the Hollywood music scene in the 60s and 70s helped guide the Laurel Canyon documentary that debuted a few years ago. His story is as historic as it is inspiring. Henry Dils, welcome to the main event. Thank you, Jim. Good to be here. <laughs> well, it's great, great to have you. I know that young people may not be familiar with your work at this point. I know their parents are, but mm -hmm. we're going to start right at the beginning because your your story is so inspirational as it relates to how you had to kind of shift things in midstream. So let's start at the beginning. How did a boy from Kansas City, by way of Great Neck, I guess, mm -hmm. find his way into the Hollywood Hills in the late 1960s? <laughs> Kind of a long, uh, you know, a long story, really. But I ended up, um, well, I was going to college studying psychology because, only because I was interested in people. I've always been interested in people all my life, you know. Uh, I think I think people are so interesting, you know. And I mean, we're all different, but we're all the same, you know. All of that is so, so, and then, I, so it, when I was, going to college in Hawaii, I started singing in a little coffee house when folk music was the big music of the land in the late 50s, early 60s. So in just about 58, 59, 60, I was studying psychology and playing music every single night in, the, in a coffee house, you know, singing. And then we put a group together. I kind of put the psychology part aside. And then we finally came to LA to record and seek our fortune. And we did, we recorded with Warner Brothers. And for about five years, we traveled back and forth across the country, um, playing college concerts and folk clubs and TV shows and really having a good time. And um, one day we stopped by a little secondhand store in Michigan. We just left, we just played the night before at University of Michigan. And in the morning, as we left town, we saw a little secondhand store and we loved to go in there and, you know, buy something we didn't need. So we pulled over, we all went in. And as we went in, right inside the door was a table full of used cameras. And the guy in front of me, the guy in my group, Cyrus, he said, oh, a camera, you know, I need one. And I was right behind him. And without even thinking, I said, Oh, why not? Me too. And I grabbed one. Never, I never thought about, you know, taking pictures or being, wasn't a plan, just a spur of the moment thing. And then when we got back in our, in our van, uh, Cyrus said, well, let's pull into the next drugstore. I'll get film for everybody. Three of us bought cameras, handed me the yellow box. I put the film in. I said, now, how do you set these numbers, Cyrus? He said, well, look on the box, you know, the Kodak box. It says sunlight, 250 at eight. I said, oh, here's 250, here's eight. Let's go out in the sunlight. So I just learned by doing it. And the thing was, we, we got back to LA about a week later and we'd been taking pictures of each other on the road, just having fun. I didn't even know what they would look like. And we got the film developed and it was slide film, little transparencies. And I, I had no idea. I said, oh my gosh, look let's get a slide projector and we'll have a slideshow. So the thing that really made me want to be a photographer was that first slideshow, because when that first slide hit the wall, you know, eight feet wide, glowing in the dark, I said, this is magic. It's like we're there again. It's like, I can't believe that we can revisit these moments, you know? I mean, I didn't come from a family where we had summer vacation slideshows, you know, I just, I'd never seen that before. And I said, man, I, I want to take more pictures so we can have more slideshows. It was, it became a social event. And I lived up in Laurel Canyon where all of my friends were musicians. So during the week I would bump into all my friends and I'd always take pictures of them. 
knowing that on the weekend we could have a big slideshow and I could show these pictures to them. It got to be a thing, you know, and they would go, oh my gosh, I didn't even know you took that. And I would go, yeah, you know, that was what I wanted to hear. And that was a good training ground, you know, for, and because all of my friends were musicians, eventually somebody said, well, hey, we, you know, we could use that for a publicity picture and we could use that for an album cover. And, and I kind of, it just kind of accidentally happened. Uh, and, you know, I, I say I photographed all of my friends and one by one, they became famous. So that was a lucky break. <laughs> That was that was as fortuitous as anything that happened in your life, probably. But yeah, tell me about how your friendships gave you access that probably another professional photographer wouldn't have had. What what yes. was different about you that that they accepted? Yeah, well, the thing is, musicians tend to be you know kind of in a in a club together. If you meet somebody on the road and they're a musician, you automatically you know, are simpatico. You're automatically friends because it's a way of life. And and musicians spend a lot of time hanging out, you know, waiting. I mean, they play a couple hours in the evening or they record some afternoon, but otherwise they're, they're, they're rehearsing, they're talking to friends, they're writing songs. It's kind of a way of life. And it involves just hanging out and being natural a lot of the time. And so, it was easy for me to, to be around them. They didn't perceive me as a photographer, an outside guy, you know, now with a camera wanting to photograph them. No, I was just a friend. And when they weren't looking, I would just go, snick, snick. you know, I'd take a couple of pictures. I, I tried to, I will say one thing. We all know that we have an astrological sign. You know, I'm a Virgo, so I collect things. So, so we do kind of, we categorize things, we make lists, we kind of collect things. And one of the things I collect is, is images, you know? But there's also a thing called your Chinese animal. And that depends on the year you were born. And so my Chinese animal is a tiger. And tigers by nature like to hide in the bushes and watch the other animals. So, and that's important because I mean, I found out years later that I was, and I said, well, it, that is exactly what I do. I mean, it may not be the bushes, it's in a, in a dressing room or somewhere backstage, you know, but I sit there quietly. And when nobody's looking, I, I take, I wanna, because I wanna take pictures, I wanna document what happens. I don't wanna set things up. I wanna see real life. And when I see real life happening, I take a few pictures of it. Usually no one even knows it. You know, and that so that's kind of my specialty is, is, you know, taking real pictures when they don't know it. So it wasn't like they'd say, OK, the photographer's here. Now we got to do whatever he says. I never said anything, you know, so that's why it was easy for me to hang out. And plus, you know, I was a musician, so I fit in with all the other musicians and, and we were all friends. Yeah. Well, you know, we're going to talk a little bit in a little while about the transformation from film and slides to mm -hmm. JPEGs and all of that. But uh, that the, yep. the thing that's interesting is that the slides, I wonder if the same impact would have been if you were just taking regular film instead of slides, because yeah. it sounded like the slides, I mean, we all know, well, those of a certain ilk know that when you put a slide on a projector and it, yeah. like you said, you feel like you're back there as opposed to having yeah. an eight by 10 even or a five by seven, that's nice, exactly. but it doesn't have the same impact. Right, exactly. You know, when, when, when my friend said, let's pull into the next drugstore and I'll buy film. I mean, if he'd have bought black and white film and I'd have developed it and had a, a proof sheet with 36 pictures, I. I would have said, oh, that's cool. I remember these moments, but it wouldn't have been that theatrical, that, that you know, event where it just blew my mind, you know, that because also the room was full of friends of mine. So we were sharing our adventures. Right, right. And, and, and yeah, I've thought of that before. If it had been black and white film, I probably wouldn't have become a photographer. So, so it just goes to show you that fate plays a role in everything that we do in life, right? Yeah. Sometimes, yeah. sometimes it just happened to work out and 
in that case, certainly it worked out great for you. I, I want to switch gears a little bit. In 1971, you were involved in a very serious airplane crash. And you probably spent some time in a hospital like a lot of the patients that will be watching this. Right. What can you tell us about that event? And, you know, and, and how was your time in the hospital? Well, well, it was a songwriter friend of mine, Jimmy Webb, who was a terrific songwriter. And he liked to fly in gliders. Gliders are airplanes without engines. And, a, and a, an, another airplane pulls you up in the air on a tow rope. And then you let go and you glide around and then you land. So, so we were doing that uh, uh, and I took this album cover. Uh, I was in the front of the glider and I turned around and took a picture of him and that became his album cover. Well, we looked, we had a slideshow and looked at those pictures and they, they looked so great. That, um, and I had taken a little Super 8 movie so we played the movie and Jimmy Webb put a record on with the London Philharmonic playing his song. And it fits so wonderfully with my little Super 8 movie. We all said, let's go back out there next week and we'll film a whole movie. So we went out there with big movie cameras. In order to make it more dramatic, we had the tow plane take us way up on the side of the mountain and then back into the mountains a little so we could come shooting out over the mountains onto the desert. But what we didn't realize was that when we got up into the mountains, there was a downdraft that pulled us down and we couldn't get over the mountain to get out to the desert. And so Jimmy said, boy, we're, we're in trouble. We can't get out of these mountains. We're gonna have to put it down somewhere. And there was no flat place. They were just all yeah. mountains. Yeah pine trees and snow on the ground. And he, but his glider instructor had taught him, if you ever have to crash into the trees, you want to crash into two trees and take the wings off at the same time. Because if you hit one wing, you're going to spin around and it's going to be worse. So he flew between the trees, took both wings off. We both were unconscious for a few minutes and woke up with the tail up in the air against the tree, looking down at the ground. Oh my gosh, it was quite dramatic, you know? And later we had a, a helicopter came and rescued us. You know, we're, we're gonna just talk a little bit here about your iconic images. You, you've recorded some of the biggest names in the world uh, in casual settings and in a professional setting. I was just wondering if you could share uh, one or two stories, maybe, of feedback you have gotten from your subjects. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it was a lucky thing timing also, because in the, I picked up a camera in 66, so the middle of the 60s. Um, and that's about when singer songwriters started. I said I was a folk singer before that. You don't write a folk song, they're a hundred year old song that you find and you right. sing them. Right. But something happened in the middle 60s partly to do with the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, partly to do with Bob Dylan writing a song for Woody Guthrie. But, you know, before that, there were songwriters and singers. Uh, there were people who wrote songs and the singers would sing them. But in the middle 60s, the singers started writing their own songs. That was a new thing. People like Joni Mitchell and James Taylor and Stephen Stills and Neil Young and Paul Simon. And all of these people started writing their own ideas about life, you know? And that, I mean, Joni Mitchell, she's such a wonderful artist, you know, and she has such a wonderful mind. And so when she puts that into a song and then sings it, it's, it's the whole package. It's wonderful. Well, that was happening right at the time I picked up a camera. And so some of my friends, like I knew Stephen Stills and I knew uh, David Crosby, and I knew Graham Nash. So the three of them started a group called Crosby, Stills, and Nash. And I'd known all of them for a couple of years, you know. Um, and so naturally, I was taking pictures of them. And they needed an album cover. And we drove around one day, found an old couch in front of an old house. They sat on the couch. You know, I took a bunch of photos. And then we had a slideshow. And we looked at the photos. And they said, that would be a great album cover. 
And so that's one of the one of my earliest album covers and one of the one of the my favorites. It's them sitting on that old couch. Um, in fact, there's a bit of a story because when we took that picture, they hadn't named themselves yet. But a couple of days later, they decided to call themselves Crosby, Stills, Nash. But on the couch, they're sitting Nash, Stills, and Crosby. So they're they're backwards, right? So I said, well, let's just go back. A couple of days later, we'll drive back and you can sit on the couch in the right order and we'll take the same picture. We got in the car, drove there, and the house was gone. <laughs> the house had been plowed down with a bulldozer. And so they had to put the album out with them in the wrong order. But but that's one of my favorite album covers. And, and a lot of people love their music and love that that okay. album cover. No, that, that's that's brilliant. Um, and, it, and of course, it's one of the most iconic album covers in history. It was probably the first of the singer songwriters. And they were a super group at the time. You know, right. there was no such thing as three, you know, different musicians coming from different bands to form one powerhouse. Right. I guess was their first ever. Uh, appearance together was that at Woodstock or was that with with Neil? Young? Yeah, no. They the night before they played a concert somewhere, and the second night they played Woodstock. Okay, the second but, night they ever actually sang together in front of an audience. You know, an audience uh, of half a million. That's right, <laughs> half a million people, and I was there to take that picture too. That Gosh. was fun. Yeah, that had, I mean. You needed to do more than uh, look at the box on the Kodak film to figure out the lighting for that shot. <laughs> but by then, <laughs> by then I learned a few things. But <laughs> I'm a so, very simple photographer, you know. I don't know a lot of tricks, you know. I just uh, yeah, okay. Let's let's I mean, look through one you of look the greatest. Through the little hole. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're going to minimize one of the greatest photographers in it, the world has ever known. Oh. Okay, so yeah, you okay. know it's Get it. I you need it. to know how to you need to know how to set the camera so it's going to get the right light reading. That's all. And then you just look through the little hole and you frame it up. You know, uh, sometimes people don't move in close enough yeah. and they take the picture and the people are a little tiny in the picture. Move up, move in, get close, get a headshot, get from the waist up. Yeah. And that's that's it. It's it's really framing how you frame that to look and. I guess as a Virgo and a, and a tiger, uh, you know, that, that was second nature to me. Um, so, and that's all there is to it. I, I don't really, I don't do dark room work. I don't develop the film. I don't do any of that. I just frame it up and push the button, you know, and wait for the right moment, you know. I guess, you know, when you look back at Laurel Canyon, it was just a very inviting place for people to practice with each other. It was, yeah, Laurel Canyon. I mean, it was just a little place where you drive up the hill from Hollywood, from Sunset Strip, and you're in the country. And families didn't live up there because there were no yards or sidewalks. There were little little cabins on the hillside. So a lot of musicians and actors lived there. Can you tell us a little bit about the Morrison Hotel Gallery? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, tell us a little bit about how you promote other artists right in the gallery as well and and it's kind of like uh you're it, you're paying it forward for your yeah. artwork yeah. well after you know about 40 50 years of taking pictures i'd had little little shows and little galleries but never my own i mean so, you know they'd say hey give us some pictures we'll hang them on the wall but some dear friends of mine one day said henry we should open up a gallery with only your pictures and so we, we found a little place in New York City and so a little storefront and we opened up a gallery. We didn't have a name for it, but it was open for a month or two. And one day I was, a, and, and so one day we had a, I had done this album cover of The Doors looking out the window of a old hotel in downtown LA and it said Morrison Hotel. And so that print of that was in the window. And I was across the street with one of my partners and we were watching people walk by and they'd walk by and look at it and then walk in, you know, it caught their attention. And I said, Peter, now look on our window. It's blank. We have no writing on our window, but down in the window at the bottom was this beautiful writing, Morrison Hotel. He said, you know what? 
that's a great idea. I'm going to call a sign painter tomorrow and have him paint Morrison Hotel on our window just to, to get attention for that photo. So once again, an accident, you know, we didn't say let's start a gallery and we're going to call it Morrison Hotel. No, it just happened organically. I mean, I think, you know, that is the thing of life. You know, the universe is going to figure stuff out. You know, sometimes you have to be patient. You have to, you can have a dream. You can follow, you can think about it, but, but let it, you know, let it work out. Let the universe figure it out. Sort of a, there is a divine plan, you know, unless you mess it up. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so be open, be ready, kind of wait for the opportunity you know, think about it, nurture it, and, and it'll probably happen. If you really want it to happen, put it out there, you know? Now, I think that there are a number of children that are in the hospital right now that really would love to see some of your images. And I was curious if there's any place online they can go. Is it yeah. associated with the Morrison Hotel Gallery or is there some other place they can go see some of your images? Yeah, no, it's you would go to Morrison Hotel Gallery dot com. OK, and here's the thing that happened for the first year or two. It was only my pictures. There'd be 100 pictures on the wall, only mine. And then one day, one of my partners said, you know, we should get a second photographer because then we could have a big opening and we could get more publicity. And so we got this guy from San Francisco. Uh, Jim Marshall, who is a, a good friend of mine, they said, if we had one other guy, who would you want? And I said, Jim Marshall. So he joined. Then we got another guy, Bob Gruen from New York. We got Neil Preston from L.A. We got Danny Clinch. We got now today we have 125 photographers that we represent. You know, we put all their pictures on the website or on the wall. Yeah, yeah. People can come in and order them and then we get the prints made. So if you go to morrisonhotelgallery.com, you have to you put my name, Henry Diltz, you'll see my pictures. Right. Or you could put uh, Joni Mitchell and you'll see everybody's pictures of Joni Mitchell. Um, now we're gonna close with something that happened, I guess, uh, just recently, right? The 2023 Grammy Trustees Award. Yeah. Why don't you tell me what that is and, and what it means to you at this point in your career? It was a big surprise to me, <laughs> you know, because, I mean, Grammys, they give Grammys to musicians and albums and stuff. And uh, they don't really give them to photographers. You could win, you know, album cover of the year. I was nominated for that, but never won. And then out of the blue, I get this message. We'd like to. We'd like to honor you with a with an honorary award for being a photographer and taking all these album covers. And I thought, wow. At first, I thought, I mean, of course, what an honor, you know. I mean, I thought, well, that's really great. But then my second thought was, oh my goodness, now I'm going to have to give a speech, you know. <laughs> now I'm going to, and like I'm that tiger hiding in the bushes, you know what I mean? I don't, you know, I don't look for the spotlight. You know, I don't want it to be about me. In fact, when people come up to me and make a big deal about, oh, my God, you've taken all these. I say, look, I'm just a guy pushing a button, you know, looking at things, pushing a button. It's you love Joni Mitchell. You love James Taylor. You love Crosby, Stills, Nash. You love the door. All those people I photograph, they're my heroes, too. They're my heroes. Incidentally, by being a photographer, I got to be at all of those concerts and go on the road and hang out and be in dressing rooms. And, and, and I got to be near the stuff I love, you know, which was music. Yeah. Um, so fact, whoever thought a banjo player, harmonica player would become a Grammy. Right. Winner. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's crazy. I, I, it was quite a big surprise, quite an honor. And quite a surprise to me because I didn't even know they did that, you know. So that's very nice. Nice to be recognized. But yeah. again, like I say, I, I don't want to be in the spotlight. You know, I want to be looking, at, you know, at what the spotlight's looking at, you know. You have so many images. I never even asked you. How do you store all these yeah. images now? Well, you know, you mentioned before digital versus film. 
in, in, in 05, 2005, I said, I will never go digital. I'm a film guy. I mean, I have a million, you know, slides. And so I will always be shooting film. And then I picked up my friend's Canon and I looked through it. I said, oh my gosh, it's focusing itself. I always focus. I take a light reading, set the numbers, focus by hand. But this Canon camera did all of that. You just pick it up and look through it and it bang, it takes the picture perfectly. And I said, that is amazing. That's a miracle, you know, because if you're not careful, you, you're, you, the focus might be a little off. But this camera, and I said, man, and I immediately switched to digital. And there were some advantages to it, you know, because with when you take slide photos, the record company wants those slides and there's no copies. So you lose a lot of pictures. But with digital, you get to keep every image and give every image away. You can send them all over the world. It's very handy. And when you take a picture, you can see right away if you got it or not. So for those was, reasons, so I have a foot in film and a foot in digital, half and half. But that's hmm. a, two pretty good feet right there. So I, I think that's a, that's a great place to tie this up. Henry Dills, I can't thank you enough. You have brought so much joy to so many people in your life. And mm -hmm. you're going to do it again here. You're going to allow for kids that are in the hospital going through a tough time to come back and realize that they're not going through it alone. They have people like Henry Dills in their corner helping them. So thank yeah. you. For that.